This is the Whirly Bear Productions podcast, where I discuss film finance and distribution with filmmakers and entertainment lawyers. This episode focuses on navigating sales and self-distribution within the independent film industry. My guest today is Marcus Marku. He's been nominated for Breakthrough British Filmmaker and successfully self-distributed his debut feature film, Papadopoulos and Sons. He used social media and guerrilla marketing tactics, which he has been honing for his new feature film, The Wife and Her House Husband. He's a great guest with a wealth of knowledge, so listen carefully because you can really learn a lot from him. Marcus Marku, welcome to the show. I'm very excited to have you here. Thank you very much, especially on a Sunday. That's very generous I'm of you. Very pleased to be here and I'm excited to talk about distribution and film production and all the mechanics that go with it. Okay, we're going to delve straight in. Um, so the BBC renewed your licence for the UK TV broadcasting rights for Papalopoulos, Papadopoulos and Sons um, for a further 10 it. years. And it's on BBC iPlayer. So I'm wondering, did you negotiate those terms? Is that possible? And did you use an entertainment lawyer over the contract? And was a lawyer recommended to you at all? Well, the origin what happened originally is when I made the film quite some time ago now, uh, we sent it to the BBC. It had Stephen Delane in it, and Stephen is a you know well known actor and he I think he would at the time was doing a BBC like TV series um, and so he's obviously a well-known British talent Stephen and the, yeah. and they were a bit they didn't it's like it, look this is the story with every film that gets made no one really knows what the value of a movie is until someone attributes value to it it could be a film, like, for example, if you get your film fe- film into the Cannes Film Festival, if you're a British filmmaker, and, you know, rarely does a British filmmaker get into Cannes. Ken Loach uh, does, and um, Cleo Barnard does, right? But there's only a handful. So if you were to get into something like Cannes, you would instantly create value for your film. The point is... The film's still the same film, but no one really knows, no one knows how to attribute value to it. So when we sent it to the BBC, when after I'd made it, they really liked it. And Stephen is brilliant in it, but they weren't, they didn't want, they didn't want to jump on it. And, um, and then, and this is, this is the advice I give to all independent filmmakers. You need to create some kind of story for your film, right? After, after the initial sort of rejection from the BBC this is a such a good story really um it then went it got into the Thessalonica Film Festival and it won the audience award there and we let the BBC know then it did a screening at the European Parliament which was a real odd one had never happened before and it was actually in the EU Parliament building that it got screened and and at the same time the Greek Prime Minister on the floor below was negotiating Greece's bailout and we were screening a film about Greeks losing money in a financial crisis. The point being that you need myth. Like when you when you hire Tom Cruise for your film or Brad Pitt or what some of these wonderful actors, you're bringing their myth to the film and that's what creates value and that's why some of these big actors charge a lot of money because they're adding PR and story to your film. So, mm. but there are other, for an independent filmmaker, there are other ways. And I will get to the point about renewing the BBC license, but you, this is a really important story because the BBC then started to take a lot of interest in the film as we were doing these really interesting things with it. And then it went to Palm Springs uh, Film Festival as a result of winning the Audience Award at Thessalonica. And again, Palm Springs probably wouldn't have taken it if it hadn't won the Audience Award at Thessalonica. And Thessalonica didn't take it because they thought it was going to win an Audience Award. They took it because George Korofas was in the movie and George had a a role at the Thessalonica Film Festival. So they were kind of doing us a bit of a favour, I think. And then at Palm Springs, by complete chance, Hollywood Reporter came to the screening. We hadn't invited them. And 
they just popped along because the guy was intrigued to see what Stephen Delane would do and then gave us a glowing review and said, it's Stephen Delane's best ever showcase. And then we sent that back to the BBC acquisitions department. And this is a really good story of how things actually work in the film business. No one knows, right? Yeah. No one knows what is good. People go, oh, I love that film. I love it. I had sales agents come to the very first screening of Papadopoulos and Sons and say, oh, I love that film. It's beautiful. It made me cry. I said, why don't you acquire it? They're like, oh, I don't know whether it will sell. You know, no one, no one's got the... Everyone's been burned by so many stories where films that should have done well don't do well. No one's willing to take mm. a chance. So they're waiting for critics. They're waiting for festivals. They're waiting for other people to go, it's a good film. So this happened with Papadopoulos. No one wanted it. I mean, nobody would have touched it. And it's it, doing these little things. And then at, at, at Palm Springs Film Festival, the Hollywood Reporter gave it a glowing review and said it's Stephen Delane's best ever showcase. And we sent that to the BBC. And they went, we're going to take this. But once it's done a theatrical release. And that is what made me go, I'm going to do a theatrical release. I do my own self-distribution. Because I just thought, the BBC are going to buy this film if it does a UK theatrical release. And I thought, well, I'll do my own. Th I was thinking about doing a UK theatrical release, my own self-distribution. And I was working not with a, well, not with a lawyer. I was working with a sales agent called Maura Ford. It's very well documented. And she, worked, she works for a company called 7 and 7. And they were very different from other sales agents in that she was just, she was just not, she was just going to uh, invoice me once I, the producer, had received the money. And normally what happens is you hand over your film to a sales agent, they represent it, and they do all the business on it. And you rarely see any money. Um, so, so the deal I had That's with tragic. Maura was... Yeah, it is tragic. And I talk That's extensively one of the reasons on this. for the podcast. Yeah, I, and I talk extensively on this. And a lot of sales agents don't like me. I don't care because a lot of them have gone out of business during the pandemic. And they're, they're, I mean, I've gone on record to say it's a sharp practice. And it is a sharp practice in that what they will do is they'll take your film, they'll take all the intellectual property of your film, you'll sign over the rights of your film to a sales agent, and you'll be with seven or eight other films. And I did the basic due diligence and went and looked at some of the financial records of these companies at Companies House. And I was having meetings with people who were very aggressive and very rude. And they would say, and be very kind of arrogant, and I said, I've been, and I'd actually stop them in the meeting and say, I've been through your company's house records. And very few filmmakers would ever do that. And I see you've wow. not even made a profit this year or last year. And then they would get flustered and go, well, we're receiving investment. I said, why would I give my film to a company that isn't making a profit? Because the That's chances are... That's a really are, good way of doing it, actually. Absolutely. Find out the financial situation of any sales agent. If they're not making yeah. a profit, how on earth are they going to pay you a single penny? Because it will yeah. all go into a loss-making, often, fantasy business. A lot of these sales agents, I'm happy to go on record again. Guess what? I'm still in business. I'm still making movies. Okay. I run a successful business in my other life that turns mm. over £4 million a year. And this year will make £1.5 million profit. I know in my non-artist life, in my kind of entrepreneur life, I know how to run a good business. I know what it takes. And when I meet a lot of these sales agents, I see, no offense, crap businesses, rubbish businesses, businesses that don't make a profit, businesses that spend too much money, businesses that are living a fantasy of going from festival to festival because they, they want to be in the film business. These people are, these people are often awful business people and failed artists. End of story. Stay away from them if you can. However, there are some good people in the business. There are some good sales agents. There are some reputable people that, under, that understand how to run a good business and who are committed to getting a good film out. Maura Ford was one of them. And so the deal I had with Maura was that I would, that, that, that the, 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 I would invoice the distributor or I would, the, the people buying the film would, would pay me and then she would invoice me after for 20%. So the deal I had with Maura was, 
she would just invoice me for 20% of all the money I received for the film. It's clean. Mm. And, and there was a, little, a few stipulations like, uh, like, I won't get into the details of it, but there were a few little sort of bits of the agreement that were actually in my favour. But by and large, the bottom, the principle of it was, if I made 100 grand from this film, as a result of an introduction that Maura made to a distributor, uh, then she would invoice me for 20%. And so we went on when we sold it to Netflix and we sold it to a German distribution company uh, and they sold it on to Arte. When the money was, f was flowing to me directly, she would then invoice me. Normally what happens is the money flows to the sales agent and often a failing business. And therefore it can't flow back to you. So, um, as the producer, so, so, so what, so what, once we did that deal with the BBC, I did the theatrical release, the BBC bought it for three years. They paid 50,000 pounds for that deal. And it was just, remember, that's just UK free TV. That was just one window, one distribution window. And a lot of people thought it was good money to get from the BBC. And I thought it was pretty good. And they did it for three years. There were other windows, you see, that you've got DVD and you've got foreign sales and you've had, we had releases in Middle East, Germany, France, French TV, Arte. So to get 50K from the BBC was really great. And, and I, I kept, I only, I only gave more of five grand of that 50, 10%, because part of my deal was that I would take her to Cannes and pay five grand for her expenses to try and sell the film. And she said I could have that 5K back from the first UK deal, which is yeah. which we did. So I, caught, I kept 45,000 pounds of that 50K, right? That's pretty cool. And you know, yeah. I've got the little agreement in my, in my downstairs loo because I did it directly. I mean, how many, how many, <laughs> film, how many filmmakers, like writer directors, get to invoice the BBC. And yeah, get the little... that's brilliant. You should be it proud. It was brilliant. And, and of course, that when the a deal expired, I wrote to them. I said to Maura, I, I need a home for the film. I just need a home for it. The deal's gone. They're not interested in renewing. I get that. Um, but I, and I said to Maura, should we, should we give it to the BBC for free? And of course, sales agents don't want to do those deals. They were like, no, Mark's not, not of interest to me. I said, can I approach the BBC directly? So I approached the acquisitions department again and they liked the film and Stephen is good in it. And it is a sweet film. And I said, look, it's a, it's a really important record. Lovely for film. The, it's a Greek Cypriot record as well. It's like, it's like until Papadopoulos and Sons, I think the only representation we had as Greek Cypriots in this country was the guy that ran the laundrette in EastEnders, who was also called <laughs> Mr. Papadopoulos, really? who you never saw. <laughs> You just never saw is this mysterious oh. character called Mr. Papadopoulos. So, so, um, so I wrote to them and said, look, it's a really important record. It's a great, and, and they went, look, look, we want this film again, but we can't pay you for free. I can't, we can't take it for free. We'll have to pay you. I said, okay, well pay me. So they, they then paid 12,000 pounds and it, I, I was happy to give it away for nothing because I needed a home for it. Right. It done its work. Yeah. And they said, normally, and I said, how, how long can I be on iPlayer for? And so they said, well, normally, and this is a 10 year deal, right? I said, they said, normally producers only allow the film to be on iPlayer for two weeks. And I wow. so I don't, I'm not using an entertainment lawyer, by the way, it's just me emailing the- So normally uh, you'd have a sales agent and an entertainment well, lawyer or? My sales agent would, my, the sales agent, Maura acts as the lawyer in all these negotiations right. she's so okay. well healed in contracts and she's been doing it for 30 years you don't really yeah. if you've got a really good sales agent you don't need a lawyer okay i, I think because that that's their job um sometimes you might need to ch get a lawyer to check the agreement you have with a sales agent i would do that yeah um uh so so but more then got involved and did the deal and, and read the contract and I, I don't do any of that. So Maura did all of that and she got her 20%, her 2K from the 12, right? Give or take. And, um, 
And then they and I and normally the film only stays on the on the iPlayer for two weeks. And I said, could I have it longer? And they went, we can go up to a year. I went, well, keep it on there for a year. So it, they, the BBC play it once a year and they keep it on iPlayer for a whole year. So it's effectively since 2020 will be on iPlayer for a decade. Yeah, that is brilliant. <laughs> that is brilliant. It's brilliant because every time I go to iPlayer in the comedy section or British <laughs> section, it's always there in the first. And that's there's great. Like, You're there with like films like Some Like It Hot and, you know, some, some of the films that you grew up with and thought, wow, I'm a, I'm a neighbour to Some yeah. Like It Hot on iPlayer. And that it's, it's a really great feeling for an independent filmmaker that did everything from scratch. Yeah. And it's my debut feature as well. It's the first thing I ever made. So... So I didn't use a lawyer. Maura jumped in on that. And that's the kind of, that's the story of the BBC deal. And I hope that gives you some insight. Yes, definitely. And you should be very proud. Well, yeah, because... Lovely. It's really heartwarming and it's very tight for a debut fe feature. Um, and I didn't, I know you didn't have an awful lot of training either. So... Well, I mean, I'm a... Inter I mean, I, I, I trained as an actor... Uh, yeah. originally at Lambda. And, th and then I spent 10 years doing improv theatre and with a really exceptional sort of practitioner, a guy called Chris Johnson, who's sadly no longer with us. Uh, mm. And, you know, I learned so much from getting up on stage without a script and improvising a model, a like improv model, and really working out how to move the story on because the and, and as a writer it, it and, and and i've done, i've made a short film that kind of takes that idea to another level called two strangers who meet five times yeah i love that and and that is the kind of like almost the execution of that idea of brevity which is you know you can you can watch like endless episodes of a box set and never feel fully satisfied. And with, with two strangers to meet five times, I've, in 12 minutes, I've done two people's lives at just five yeah. key turning points. So what I learned improvising was how to make, how to move the story on. Because so much of what we do as writers is um, padding. Like, and it's point, ultimately it's, it's fun or funny. And it, and it's, it's, enjoyable but in storytelling terms often it's just padding so for me as a writer i've made i've just made a new uh, film i've just made a film which is just two actors called the wife and a house husband will you come to it at the british urban film festival screening if you want it's in november at the end of the no, it's in first of december you're invited i've got a few spare tickets because it's Shoreditch, it's your way. Wow. If you can't, yes. If you can't come in March can, when I'm doing but... cinema. <laughs> okay. Well, well, afterwards I'll give you the details, um, and I've got a couple of spare tickets. But I'm really proud of that for the same reason, which is brevity, like getting getting to getting to the point of the drama, like who is doing what to whom and why, and yeah. and. And all, all audiences increasingly are more sophisticated than we've ever been, I think. Mm. Because we have watched so much drama. And you can look at films that you admired in the 70s or 80s, 90s. And now they, they date because then they're, they waffle too much. They get off story. And you, but you can watch Shakespeare and go, oh my God, he's on it. 500 years later, he's still tight, as it were. Yeah. So I guess, it, you know, we are increasingly more sophisticated. And, and I think maybe the reason Papadopoulos, I mean, it's got, it sags in parts and I wish I could go back and, and do something different a little bit. I wish I had more time for rehearsals actually, um, to get the actors, because the way I shoot and tell stories is, is uh, I like long takes and I don't want to edit too much. And I want as much to happen within the frame as possible. 
and it gives mm. it a sense of aliveness and authenticity. But that's another story. But yeah, thank you for that. So that's that was the BBC deal. Yes, I want to know how you distributed it in the in the States. Well, I tried with Gather. You mentioned Gather. Gather's cinema yes. on demand. And we had some really successful screen. And how Gather works is, is um, the, the, the Gather signed up all the cinemas across the States. And where there's gaps in their programming, anyone can book the theatre space. But you need to get a minimum of 25 people to trigger the screening. So Gather was hit and miss with me in Sacramento and you needed a movie captain and I was doing it from the UK. So how it works is you, so you didn't go over there. You had to drum I didn't up go the over there. I was doing it marketing. from the UK, but you have movie captains that effectively gather a screening for you. And so I would find these movie. I put out the call on social media. Who wants to be a movie captain for Pab Doppler's and sons? Uh, you need to find me 25 people on this date in this cinema for it to then go forward. And Despina, who was my most successful movie captain in Sacramento, California, filled a 300 screen cinema. Do you know what I mean? Wow. So we had these, and That's that was- fantastic. And then sometimes there'd be only like 50 people or 30 people, but-, but That's a lot though. Yeah, but for one-off screenings, they were great this way. And then you could split the, the box office income with Gather and the cinema. So the cinema took a chunk, Gather took a chunk, and then you took a chunk. I, I wasn't doing it for the money. I was just trying to get it up and so running. So what's the split? What's the percentage split? From my, I can't remember. I'd have to go back. It was some time ago. Um, and there's a, there's a cinema on demand company in the UK that does the same thing. Oh, what are they called? Huh. Um, I feel an edit coming on here while I look. Cinema. I can put I, it in the show notes. Okay. I'll find it. The cinema on demand, equivalent of Gather in the UK. There's a company that exists that does exactly that. Um, so that's, that helped, but it, what, it, what didn't give me the momentum that I was looking for. I didn't get the breakout. Do you know what I mean? I mean, it's so hard to get a breakout. I mean, you look at some incredible, you look at stories like, um how silver i mean we, we hate mentioning his name because he's an awful man and quite rightly in jail weinstein i mean yeah horrific horrific monster his way of distributing films though was a, a lesson in how to do it which was how he did silver linings playbook for example where he he i mean even though that had de niro in and Jennifer Lawrence and all of these amazing actors. He, he, you know, you start in like three or four cinemas in New York and then you kind of platform it out. And but, 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 but there was no better platformer distributor than him, actually. He knew how to get it out there, get the right momentum and there are other stories of that success. You look at something like um, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. Same story, but that was accidental, I think. It kind of started, it was like nobody wanted that movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding. And they put it in a handful of cinemas in New York, and then it went crazy. And then it went global. I think it reached something like 3,000 screens at one point at its peak. You can check all this on Box Office Mojo, by the way, how a film yeah. does that. And, and, and I think it's, re it's really hard to get, uh, like, it's really like, we're com like, it, like stories, like dramas, comedies, rom-coms, thrillers, um, love stories. These are really hard to get into, into cinemas now. It was hard before the pandemic. After the pandemic, it's, I think it's almost impossible um, because we can't, pe it's difficult to get people out to the cinema to see these things because we're so now used to seeing them on our screens. I want to know, I think your trailers are great. So um, who edits your trailers? 
Do you get an edit house or? Well, the first trailer that's made is yeah. the editor that's edited the movie. It's the last thing they do. Okay, can you give me? Th- but all the other promotional trailers that go out on social media, I do those. Yeah. Do you do A B testing with those? No, the... I just put them out. No, I like this one that's going out. Yeah. And Twitter's great because, okay, and now Instagram as well, allow you to put other people's music on and it's as long as it's credited. And so, um, so yeah, so I, the, I always get the, the editor to do one trailer, which would be the main trailer for the movie because they've sat with the film for many, many weeks. And they know every beat and moment and they're the right people to make that. But for social, social media now allows you to do multiple trailers, like one a week if you had, if you wanted to. And I, and I think that's a really good thing to do to promote the film. The, you know, the idea that it's just one trailer per movie is very old, you know, it's an old fashioned way of. You need more and more content. Yeah. So I'm, 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 I do a trailer, I do a trailer for every festival I'm going into or, you know, or sometimes it's yeah, whatever, whatever it takes to get people's attention again. So I do those. And How long do you keep your official trailer? Well, it's a fi- It's How always it? official. Trailers are sometimes two minutes. Oh, how long? Um, it's about two yeah. minutes. Yeah, two minutes. Yeah. And it's okay. on YouTube at the moment. And then your one on social media, varying length. Yeah, the ones on social media can be 30 seconds or 60 seconds or the whole two, another. Two. I think that's long enough for a trailer. I normally, I don't like to look, watch trailers a lot of the time. No, I, I think you're right. But what I did with a trailer I just did for the wife and her house husband is I found an Everly mm. Brothers song, which is exactly two minutes. And I thought, well, I could just, just do the whole, just basically... It's almost the song. It's like a pop video in a way. Yeah. So that it depends what your approach is to the trailer. But you're right, 30 seconds can be enough. But with this, it was just like an opportunity to get all the silent moments from the movie. So there's no dialogue. There's just just actors reacting to each other. That's beautiful. And then I just yeah. put an Everly Brothers song on there. Uh, Love Hurts. And then it's just reactions. And then you just think, oh, it's like a pop video, <laughs> but it's really promoting my film. Mm. And I've been able to use an Everly Brothers song and it's, you know, it's not licensed, but it's fine because Facebook and Instagram now have this agreement with certain songs that you're allowed to do that, it's credited. And Twitter is liberal, so I got away with it. And I'm only putting it on Twitter, do you know what I mean? And so you used Florence and the Machines, Dog Days Are Over. Oh, that's another story. Your... That's a crazy story. Yeah. Well. How did you get well, it? And is, how long did it this take? This is a crazy yeah. story. Because. Go on then. <laughs> firstly, let's, let's all give thanks to Saint Florence and her machine. Because she is a wonderful human being. Um, yeah. Uh, she, well, my edit, the editor that was editing Papadopoulos has whacked it on there. As, and I thought, oh, that's brilliant. But I was so naive. I didn't know how to go get the rights. And then someone said, you've got to get the rights for this. So I was like, oh, so we tried the official route <laughs> and I couldn't get anywhere. And I was like, oh God, I can't get Which anywhere. is? What's, Universal what's the music. official route? Right. Oh. Um, and they were like, okay. I don't think they were even, I think what happened was we put it out Someone at Universal Music saw it and then just got it taken down from YouTube. Yeah. And I was like, oh, God, I'm going to have to use another. So I'm going to have to recut a trailer. But in, back then, like now, someone can whack me the file and I can knock my own trailer out and find royalty-free music. But back then, it was everything. I didn't know how to edit. I didn't have the software to edit. It was still, you know, the, the software and you had to have an editor. And I was like, oh, God. Now, if that happened, I'd be like, fine, I'll just put an, I'll edit my own trailer and I'll whack a royalty free song on there and whatever, or I'll get the composer to do something. But anyway, back then it was like, oh, they took it down. So I was like, oh God, how am I going to get it up again? So I tried Universal, they were ignoring me. And then Georgia Grew, who's an actor in Papadopoulos and Sons, was coming by for a, a coffee to say hello. 
She is the nicest person on the planet, Georgia Groom. Honestly, she is one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. Just, just all heart, that woman. And she, and she's very kind of, she's very kind of free spirited. So she kind of just wanders in your life and then wanders out again. So she kind of wandered in, and she said, hey, "What's wrong with you?" And I said, oh, "I can't. I've, lo I've, can't, I've lost our trailer for Papa Doppler and Sons because it's got Florence in the machine." And she said, "True story." She said, "Oh, I know Florence really well. She, oh, wow. she lives next door. I think to, to her boyfriend at the time, uh, and." And she said, I was locked. Oh, no, no, that's it. She goes, I know, I'll, I'll, I'll ask her next time I see her. I was like, please, Georgia, please. That would oh, be wow. so helpful. Anyway, a couple of weeks go by and I think, oh, that's not going to happen now. Georgia's flown into my life like an actor free spirit that she is. She's promised me, my hopes, that. She's promised me she'll get Florence <laughs> to sign this off. And then they, these actors, they disappear again. Do you know what I mean? They're on to the next thing in there. Holly go lightly live. They're busy. <laughs> we love them. But they're, anyway, so I think, ah, oh, she ain't going to get back to me. And then, and then, and then I get like a random call out the blue from Georgia Groom saying, oh my God, I was, I was locked in a cupboard with Florence at a party last night that we ended up in a cupboard. Wow. And I, I <laughs> then pitched her, could we use um, Dog Days Are Over for the Papadopoulos trailer? And Florence said, yeah, take it. Not a problem. <laughs> and so she goes, hope that. So there you go, Marcus. Bye. Puts the phone down. I'm like, brilliant. So I then email Universal wow. Music. But wait. Wait. Look at the email. Hi. Dear Universal Music, my friend Georgia was <laughs> locked in a cupboard at a party <laughs> with Florence. And Florence says, it's fine for me to use the song. Please. Actually. And you let of course, they just completely ignore me. Because it sounded so mad. They probably think, what? That's ridiculous. Well, the interesting thing is making yeah. it up, and it's mad. It's just another nutcase. Yeah. Oh, so anyway, I get an email back saying some words to the effect of, yeah, right, whatever. Nice try. I'm like, but check with Florence. She was locked in. A... So I'm like, oh. So I ring up George and went, uh, it's no go still. They think I'm making this stuff up. And she, so she said, I think she gave me uh, her dad's number. She goes, well, look, I don't know where she is at the moment, but this is her dad's number. I think he was called Nick. I can't remember his name. So I ring him and, and like, I spend the next two, three weeks having the most insane relationship with Florence's dad. And he's going, I don't know where wow. she is at the moment. But I'm, I'm like, I'm desperate for help. I don't know where she is, Marcus. I'm doing my best. I mean, if you can find her, please let me know where she is. I'm thinking, I am never going to get this song cleared. Anyway, as a last gasp attempt, my, my trailer is still down on YouTube. As a last gasp attempt, I find her address. Uh... And I managed to get her physical home address. I'm a master of getting addresses one way or another, but only for good causes, cool. never for bad. Yeah. I would have been a really good private investigator, I think. And um, yeah, and and I, I get the I get the DVD of Papadopoulos. And stuff. I just write a net letter, dear Florence. I'm desperately trying to get your song cleared for. Um, the, the trailer I said Georgia was locked in a cupboard with you and you said it was fine I then spent the next two weeks chasing your dad who by the brackets who by the way is hilarious <laughs> who is trying to chase you could you please let him know where you are <laughs> and I said 
and and I said, if if any if, if you can do anything great, if not, it doesn't matter. Thank you. And then I put it through her letterbox. And the next day, I got an email from Universal Music saying, it's all clear, it's all fine. Your song's back up. Um, but we need to get this documented. And I said, I'm ready to sign anything. And then silence again. So it's still there. That's That's how I did it. So no documents were ever signed. It was just back up. It sounds like a long process. It's not the way you should do it. I've 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 done it properly subsequently with a and this without being locked in a cupboard with the artist. So subsequently you use a music supervisor. The music supervisor contacts oh, would contact okay. get all the rights for you. There's you know the performance publishing rights they would then agree a fee you pay the fee it's then done under the contract blah 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 and i've done i did that with my last film with i just used one track from a relatively unknown artist but it's a beautiful song and i loved it so much i found it on youtube and um uh and i did did all that that the, 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 that's the right way of doing it. But this was the, the first time I was doing anything, so I didn't really know what I was doing. Good story? Oh, there's a great story. Thank well, you for sharing. There is a right way of doing like it. And the, and what, the right way of doing it is to engage as a music supervisor. And they will have a fee structure. And they will negotiate on your behalf. And it's it's still a painful process. Right, getting music for your movie, but you have options. If something's too expensive, you you find someone that isn't, and you just keep going. And the ultimate option is if you're using a composer to make right music for you, and you need something for a trailer. This is what this is. Then yeah. you get them to write for the trailer as well, as part of the deal. Yeah. And if you need rights, I think start early. Yeah, it start like early. But if you're getting yeah. your own music done, it's so much easier. It's so much easier. Yeah. Um, so I heard a line producer say recently that you're unlikely to get an experienced crew for your film if the budget is under a million. I'd like to know your thoughts on that. And also where you got your well, cast and your crew, like what if, platform did you advertise if you, on? If you... Because your crew were great, clearly. Well, I built up relationships with some crew, like Chris Ferguson, who's the DOP on The Wife and a House Husband, was the DOP on Office Song, and he was the DOP on Two Strangers Who Meet Five Times. Now, he charges, as he's become more experienced, a lot more money. But for me, because he likes me and he likes my work, he's going to do me an independent film rate. And I think the same with actors. It's the same with actors. You know, if you've built up a relationship with an actor who then subsequently becomes famous, and I hear this story all the time, they'll still work for you for peanuts because they like you. They like your work. And they want to work with you because it's... An enjoyable experience and you're right it's difficult to get a great crew if you were going from scratch right and you were under you know a low budget it's really hard to find an experienced crew because they don't know you and you're not paying much money so you have to go with a less experienced crew but hmm but i'm papadopoulos and sons you know you can't tell that they didn't have well, a lot they were of an experienced experience. crew they I were an experienced think. crew. Yeah, they were. And, okay. But but they but came with budget, wasn't it? an experienced line producer in Sarah Butler. And they trusted her and liked her and they'd worked with her for years on various. So so they were willing to take Have a, a pay cut to make this yeah. film. But also, which I'm indebted to, by the way. I'm very grateful for that but also subsequently it's a film they're all proud of 
It's a film they're proud they were involved yeah. with. It's one that they show their kids. You know, they go, I may, oh, I love this film. It's a film they love. So, weirdly, there were hardly any invoices. Normally when you rap, the invoices come in. Because crew, crew are up the way they've been treated. <laughs> but I treat, I treat every yeah. crew member and every supporting artist, actor, anyone with the utmost respect and dignity that any human being deserves in their place of work, right? And it's, I'm there to serve these people as the director and as the producer and as the financier, uh, it is my duty to do so, right? And it is with immense pride and satisfaction that I can say that everyone I've ever worked with will work with me again, if they're available. Yeah, that's the benefit. And I would think that you'd get the best out of people the of happier they are. I'm when there, to, I'm there as, as, as really as a, as a filmmaker, as, as the filmmaker, right? And as the filmmaker wears mm. multiple hats, right? The writer, the director, the independent filmmaker yeah. wears many hats, right? I scout locations, I look for music, you know, I, I've written the screenplay, I'm finding the money, I'm trying to get favours from people. Everyone gets paid, right? Everyone gets paid. Um, it might be less than what they might get on like a Hollywood blockbuster. But the truth is that it's not far off it. Like, you know, it's like, this is the other thing that I don't like about the film business is the disparity where a guy that's holding a boom, like gets paid like a thousandth of what, and I'm not talking, I'm thinking talking a thousandth of what an actor might get. And I, as an actor, I would feel deeply uncomfortable working in that situation. I'd be like, hang on a minute. This guy is really, you know, is oft often then often crew are not treated well either. And, and the stars of, of movies never know this really. Although some treat the crew even worse. And that's why sometimes you get these conflicts between crew and actors, you know, you get these battles because, because there's lack of awareness of what the hell is going on. And these people have no idea. Some of these actors have no idea of the reality of the people that they're working with. And then you hear these stories of, you know, famous TV presenters and actors who are in the like trouble on social media because they treat waiter staff so poorly or and 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 then you hear the stories that the crew that have worked with the this particular person for many many years still hasn't they still don't know their first names and i've heard mm. those stories about this particular person because i know crew that have worked on his shows and they will just they won't even say peter simon john can they'll say sound guy sound guy oh gosh M mic me up that's yeah horrible. it's horrible and and i'm glad i hope that guy gets taken down in a big way without mentioning names because he deserves it because the stories i've heard are all true they're all coming out mm. you can't treat people poorly like this and so um so i think for independent filmmakers what you can offer the cut the crew the hard-working crew is an experience um that is nurturing that's rewarding that's empowering you allow them to fulfill their creative potential without the fear of making mistakes right because there's a whole kind of culture of the film set of mistakes and getting fired mistake fired mistake fired mistake fired you know what I mean? It's like, no. Yeah, and speaking up and getting fired as well. No one wants to speak up about anything. And, and, and I'm all for that. I'm all fired. for 
or not being hired again. You know, it's like it's and and but it creates this incredible conflict. Like it's deep, like ages old conflict that seems to then reverberate from film set to film set. To film. It's an energy, right? So I was never I was never part of that. So it, I did, I I just I just I could just be fatherly and and even when you had difficult people like some people would be difficult and spiteful and negative there was always a way of bringing them into the fold and maybe thinking maybe this person doesn't feel they're being heard it's the same with actors actually it's like um you're what you're doing with with actors who are dropping their pay scale to make an independent film, you're giving them, and not all actors are in that mode, by the way. There's some actors just, just won't do it. They're like, why would I do that? Um, but there are other actors who are famous and high earners who have what we call an indie streak. And they have a love of independent films and they also have a love of the culture of an independent film it feels like being in rep theater do you know what i mean everyone mucking in like you don't have the you're not you're not you're not ensconced in a big winnebago and then being micromanaged to the to the set in your puffer jacket and all of that you're you feel like you're getting dirty you know you feel like you're getting sweaty you feel like you're getting in the in the in the kitchen where it's being cooked and you're and and the, that spirit of independent filmmaking because it's quick and it's sometimes frenetic but positive it leaves you on a high and the actors love it actors love it now like, when are we going to do this again marcus i want to do this again because you, you've 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 basically you're you're part of something and you're uh, you are you feel embedded as, as 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 part of the whole creative process as opposed to someone that's flown in you do your bit and then they fly you out again fly in do your bit fly fly out again and that's the beauty of independent film and of course we're all on the we're all like earning roughly the same and so suddenly actors feel really comfortable it's like well i'm not earning much more than the boom operator on this one so I can really relax. I can talk to him about his family and the land. Suddenly we're all friends. There isn't that division where, uh, you know, which you would get on a Hollywood film set. I get that. I get why people want to make Hollywood movies because it's money. I get it. But for me, there's just the other ways of making money. I think you can make films with an experienced crew. But you have to be in a position to sell them an experience. And that comes from either having worked with these people before or them reading your screenplay and meeting you. That's happened to me on Papadopoulos. No one, you know, they read the screenplay. Then they met me and they're like, OK, I'm going to do this. But the quickest way, the quickest way, actually, for an, if you like, if you like for advice for people starting out, Go hire a line producer with those contacts and that trust who likes you and make that line producer the producer. Because mm. what that line producer will do is pull in favours because they're getting a bigger credit. Sunny, and actually, um, yeah, I mean, I've seen that happen all the time. People just getting, I give that advice all the time. And the fact the location manager on Papadopoulos and Sons has ended up becoming a, ended up becoming a line producer. Now is a top, top, top producer delivering all the Netflix series. Because I had a friend say to me, I'm looking for a producer. And I put him in contact with Darren. And Darren was a location manager. And his first big producer credit was this independent film 
And then he ended up line producing BBC's War and Peace. And then he ended up producing. So it's an incredible, like, even if you can't find a line producer to make a producer on your independent film, your first indie film, find a location manager. Because a lo an experienced location manager will do 60% of the budget anyway. They're, they're, they're there or thereabouts to becoming a line producer. So you can say to a location, like an experienced location manager, do you want to be a producer of my independent film? They're not going to say no. They go, yeah, I want that producer credit. No. And I can help you find yeah, locations. Please. And I know how that's to, a, because really good location is, is, is like, is 60% of your budget. Well, it's a good chunk of how, not 60% of your budget, but it affects, it touches 60% of your budget. It touches all the other areas. Yeah. Production design, production department, art, des art design, mm. it, um, uh, crew, lunch, all of that. And, and, and it's logistics. So the location manager understands lo logistics. So that person is a good person. If you were like an independent filmmaker and you were struggling and you wanted to know how to get a good crew, you'd probably hire a location manager, make them a producer and get them to, to tap into their network. Now, tell us about cinema for a pound well, and why I'm, you've chosen this I, tactic. I think I've made a good film and it deserves an audience. It doesn't have star names in, and I'm not a star director, right? That's going to get, get like snapped up by the big fe festivals. And I don't have any star names in this piece, but I've got the right actors, right? It's like, you know, it was a real lesson for me. Like, um, you know, the right actors for your film might not necessarily be household names but they are the right actors. And, and in this case, it works perfectly. Um, they're brilliant in it. And it's their lit first lead for both of them in, in a feature film. So I, I, I need to, you know, I always believe the spirit of a film dictates its distribution and it dictates who you work with. And I've, I've always been lucky in that the right people have come in and the right people have managed to find the project uh often against what it is that i want and therefore i have to trust the spirit and energy of a project to attract it sometimes these things know m more than you know it's a weird world we live in i think it's much weirder than we give it credit for but these idea of coincidences it seems to happen a lot with creative projects so i found these the two actors came to it very last minute but the thing is i can't i can't, can't get it into like a famous festival and no one's going to distribute this or no one's even remotely interested in it even even to see it they just go look the moment i say who's in it uh it's they're not famous names and this is the this is the nature of our business and these actors know this too, but yeah. they're incredibly good in it. And I think they are just really grateful for the opportunity to cut their teeth on something like this. And I hope that they go on, and I think they will go on to, to, to bigger things financially and creatively. So I, Cinema for a Pound is really a way of shortcutting the, the, the traditional distribution route which is, well, I'll stick it in cinemas. I'll four-wall it. Four-walling means I'm going to hire the cinema space, which means I can charge the price. So I'm going to four-wall it. I got a discount on four-walling. That's key to making this work. So I've hired the Prince Charles. Can you tell us about the conversation? Cinema booker. The... It has to go through a cinema booker, and it goes through Martin Myers. Ma right. So you didn't go there to the cinema and be like, so, hi. So Martin Myers opens the door for you and martin opened right. the door with a guy who runs the um the prince charles cinema in leicester square a guy called greg we all love, love it cinema. greg runs it yeah. he's like when you go meet greg he's a scottish <laughs> guy and he's like he's like he's like yeah. he's, he's like a king of independent film and he and he, he, there's a warren in that cinema it's old 
So when you go meet him in his office, he sits on a yeah. higher level than you in his chair and you're sitting down. And I said to him, it's like meeting, <laughs> it's like, it's like having an audience with the king of indie film in this Warren, right? It's so indie with all these posters of these great indie yeah. films, right? That we all love. And you're like, this is the heart of independent film. And Greg is the, like, mm. the rat king in the sewers of indie film. <laughs> you won't mind me saying this. Um, and you are pleading with for audience and a chance. And he just gave me, he just met me. And, All right, Marcus, I'll give you three weeks. So he's given me, like, he's allowed me to hire the, the, the 100 screen cinema for three weeks. And I'm going to charge a pound. And then wow. that allowed me to, with Martin, to convince the Mockingbird in Birmingham for a week. And then one more screen in Bristol for a week. And I said to Martin, let's just stop there because it's really hard work. A lot of people were not interested. They don't want to know. They just don't want to know. Uh, even indie screens, they just don't want to know. Yeah. Now, the advantage of Martin Myers is it's an official, it will be done through his company, as it were, the booking, as it were. And he's an mm -hmm. official kind of distributor in the Association of Distributors or whatever it is. But then that allows you to go in the book that are then the press book that gets you the, the, the critics in. Does that make sense? So, so yeah. a cinema booker is a good way to do it. Someone like Martin is an, a great way because effectively counts as official distribution. It's officially distributed. It means you can go up for your BAFTAs. It means you're going to get your critics in. It means you're up and away. And it, it means you've short-circuited the festival route. Like normally what would happen is you get your film into a festival, a, a distributor would pick you up and do that bit of it. I'm doing that all myself. And it's I'm doing it quite cheaply because I'm doing it from the BFI tax credit uh, for the film. So I made... The wife and her house husband for uh, my budget was 280 and it's money that i'd saved yeah and money from my wife mm -hmm. as well uh she had inherited a little bit and it's money i'd saved for my business and i got a pot together and i thought well i'll just write a screenplay that will fit the pot you're never supposed to do that it was originally gonna it was originally going to anchor a bigger film. It was the 300 or so grand was going to anchor the finance of another film that I was going to make called Ali's English, which was a, uh, a feature film version of Two Strangers. And I thought, and that all fell in during pandemic. So I thought, well, I'll take the, the pot that was going to anchor a bigger film and I'll just make the whole film within the pot. Of, of 300 it was 280 that i set aside and i wrote a screenplay and built a production around the budget you're never supposed to do that but i did it and i really god i was mm. i loved it it was just so liberating to get my indie roots again going in that way and uh i spent 260 20 i saved for distribution of the 260, 20 of that was COVID. 10 up front and 10 when we had a COVID crisis. So actually money spent on making the film was 240. Anyway, the tax credit coming back to me is about 50, 60 grand. I can't remember exactly. I've used, so I put that 50 with my other 20, that's 70. So I have a pot of seven, a war chest of 70 to get this film out there without going to Venice or Cannes or Sundance. That's the challenge. So, yeah. I love it. It's good. I like that you've, you know, placed it all together. You've used this from your yeah. tax money. Thanks. Yeah. So what else? So you've got your cinema for a pound. What what's the marketing leading up to? Well, I, I really, I've, it's social media. It's getting people to sign up. I've had three, four hundred people sign up for it. Mm -hmm. Um, and and it's good. 
are you're going to bring how many people are you going to bring in March? Loads. Amber, you're going to have to bring. I go make don't some forget, friends. listen. And then you I... can bring yourself and four <laughs> friends for five pounds. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. I. I know, because in your video, you were like, you can bring like nine friends and it's a tenner. And I was like, yeah, that's a good point. Take exactly. You cinema. can be as you can be. You can bring nine, nine friends. It's done. I think it will sell out. I th once once the phone lines go, it will go because people are gonna be like, oh, I'll book yeah. five. I'll book five. I'll book. I hope anyway, and it's a great idea, right? Because it puts bums it on seats. Yeah. At a time, right, when a movie like Marriage Story, which I love that film, by the way, my wife didn't like it so much. She didn't think she was sympathetic or likable but 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 adam driver i think was so extraordinary in that i kind of fell in love with him i just thought wow why would you why would you leave this guy? why would you leave this guy <laughs> what are you doing to him <laughs> i i i think it was the sympathy was but then 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 i have I have I took a female friend to see that that isn't my wife who completely sympathized with her with Scarlett Johansson's character and um it's inter it's a real divider that one I loved it I love the how it divided audience um so so yeah it's like what a bonkers thing Amber I'm like I'm putting a micro budget movie in cinemas at a time when big with big blockbusters, won't even go near a cinema. And I'm doing it as a double bill with two strangers who meet five times for a pound. And I'm introducing every screening. What more do you want? It's, it's like, it's like, it's like, and I will do, I will do all my mailing and spamming and emailing and hustling friends and hustling friends of friends and hustling people that I know that run various organizations and come on. I'll do the hustle. I'll be standing outside handing out flyers um, and trying to convince maybe a couple of famous actor friends to come and hand some flyers out with me. Um, uh, there you go. And then, and then, and then, and then my job's done, right? It's like, what more can I do? I wrote it. I directed it. I financed it. I produced it. I'm now self-distributing it. I'm handing out the flyers. I'm done. And it's like, it's in the lap of the gods after that. It's like, I've done everything for this baby to nurture, to grow. And I pushed them out into the world. And then, then that's it. They're, they're on their own after that. Not, not more I can do after that. Not more I can do after that. I mean, it could be a complete disaster, right? You know, you might get those awful reviews, those two stars, go home, Marcus. Don't give up the day job. And then you're like, oh, well, there's nothing I can do. I've done it. I've done it. And that's that. And better to have, I mean, really, like, really, it's so satisfying. The idea that I'm sticking it in there for a pound. It's so satisfying. I can't tell you how satisfying that feels. It really is like, because I'm using my tax credit to do it. I'm basically taking the tax credit and subsidizing the audience. It's so that feels so right. But I'm basically taking the money the British taxpayers given me and I'm using it to subsidize ticket prices. I love that. And that's probably what the tax credit was for. But often what happens with independent filmmakers is they've sold the tax credit up front to get the film made. That's what happens. You take, you take your tax credit. Yeah. And you say that, um, Exhibitors um, and distributors should have uh, tax rebates. Yeah, I think so as well. I think I think I think what I've always argued is so, that if you are being incentivized for cultural reasons to make a film in Britain, that's what the tax credit is. The BFI tax credit is the British independent markers, films. Are you making yeah. a film in Britain? Yes. Are you making it with British cast and crew? Yes. Oh, we really like that. Is it a story about Britain, Britain in some way? Yes, it is. Oh, well, we, we'll give you 20% back for doing that. 
it's twenty five percent of eighty percent of your budget. We'll give you twenty percent back because we want to incentivize the making of this film for all those reasons we ju you've just given. If I then go to an exhibitor, or dis if I go to a distributor and say, "Will you distribute my film?" They will say, "Marcus, we love your film, but it's too British, and we've only got a pot of money, and we're going to buy the we're going to buy a." Uh, a Jennifer Aniston rom-com just for the UK rights I'm saying but I'm giving you global rights I know you're giving us global rights but it's a very British film that can only play in Britain this is the madness of where we're at the madness is I'm, I'm incentivized by the taxpayer to make a British film but the economics of the distributor are such that he has to use his limited resources to buy an American film for British cinemas that will only play in Britain. Because that is more economically beneficial than taking a British film and selling it globally. That's why the, the incentive has to be extended. So you've, in, the British taxpayers incentivize me to make a British film. The, the British taxpayer now needs to incentivize the distributors and exhibitors to get that film screened and distributed. You can't, the, the incentive just stops with me, but it should be carried on. So that there's, what's the point of incentivizing British yeah. filmmakers to make British films if the British distributors are not distributing them? That's the economic argument that needs to be- It makes It does make a lot, a lot of sense. sense. What and it's saying. unfortunately, no one cares. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what happens um, with studios and streamers and cinema audiences. It's it's all in flux, isn't it? And in the middle of it, I'm doing my cinema for a pound yeah. in a little theatre in Leicester Square. <laughs> <laughs> but that's fantastic. We need people like you doing what you're doing. Good. It's brilliant. And sharing all of your knowledge. Knowledge that other people, you know, maybe don't want to yeah. share. So, um, you know, understandably as well. Um, so what's, what's the future? Of I don't know. Double M film? I always, I... You're like, God, I'm just, no, I'm I right don't in the know. middle of cinema for a pound. I always get to this pound. point where I, <laughs> and I have this conversation with my wife where I go, ah, maybe that's it. I'm done now. I've made a, I always feel like that. No, I, I, I don't believe that because well, I know I, how passionate I, you I are and how much my you enjoy it. Life, not doing <laughs> these things, you know, like enjoying. I love <laughs> photography. I'm a street photographer. I wander the streets. I can do that every day for hours and not never get bored. I have two children that I'm passionate about, yeah. and I have a business that is profitable and has its duty it has a real responsibility to 35 employees you know it's like you know i'm very i'm very content with my life it's like do i, I ever, but then i've been here before my wife reminds me goes you've been here before marcus and then suddenly something comes along so i i don't actively go seek trouble and making independent films is it's intense <laughs> You know, it's really intense because you're doing everything. You know, you're finding the money, you're writing the screenplay, you're building a production team, you're executing the production, and then you're distributing. It's 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 intense just doing one of those things, right? It's a big commitment for a long period of time to be wearing all those hats. And a lot of responsibility on your shoulders. Yeah, I'm doing it as a passion. Everyone's and, looking up uh, to you. Mm. Few people even begin to get this. Like, just, just don't get it. It's like, well, if you were really good, you'd get an agent and you'd go be making ITV dramas. No, I, I really wouldn't. I really wouldn't. That's That might be my idea of hell. Yeah. People said, well, people you said get, that to you. Get, get, yeah, they say you should get an agent, Mark. Really? You should get an agent now and start being serious. Wow. 
A lot of people tell me that. I get that every month. Get an agent, Marcus, and be serious. Put yourself out. And I'm like, it's not what I want to do. It doesn't make me feel happy. But you're in this position where you can work, you know, the way you work is fantastic. You've worked very hard to be in the yeah, position and, and the where truth you can is, finance you know, your Two film, strangers who meet five times but... is approaching three million views on YouTube was made for 25 grand, 25K. So it's not even yeah. as if you go, oh, I can't be a filmmaker because mm. I haven't got a million quid to make a feature. You know, there are even better films than Two Strangers that were made for less. Do you know what I mean? On a mobile phone. That's the truth. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. Paranormal there Activity, made for yeah. $15,000, you know? No, you don't. You don't you need, need a lot of money. You, sometimes you need money. Even uh, locations down. But what you do need is passion and, and uh, commitment and... Uh, you do you do need it's very paranormal activities a rare mm. one and even like you know even two strangers right it's still a lot of money for a lot of people 25 grand that you know you're never gonna mm. get back right and that's the reason it was 25 grand was because for two days yeah. we employed a small battalion of filmmakers crew sound recorders camera equipment locations so it's 25 grand intensely most of it spent in two days so mm. it's still money isn't it it's still a lot of money for a lot of people and yeah. for, for those artists i say you got to get a different find a different yeah. medium to express yourself because it's expensive You've got to write a novel well it's unfortunately no. Money to be made in short film. I don't think there's much money. If that could change, that would be great. The, um, in any film, like even like most Hollywood movies film. are loss making. <laughs> I, I, yes, I did listen to some figures the other day. This is why I'm making the podcast because I studied film and television, you know, and three years down the line, uh, we haven't been taught this side of the industry. And I, so I thought I write my dissertation about film finance and sales and self distribution. And I started scratching this, the surface. Can I, I just like, ask, oh has this been God, a useful podcast? This is terrifying. Has this been useful for you? This, one, this conversation with me? Podcast? Yeah, of course. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Let's of just hope course. no one How at the BFI hears it right. Yeah. I don't think they will. Yeah. But then I had a friend, How right? Rude. I had listened to that really great, great story. He, um, <laughs> he was an actor and he'd fallen out with some people at the National Theatre. And, uh, and we went, went for a walk with him one day and he said, um, I think I'm a bit blacklisted by this theatre because I fell out with them a few years ago. And I said, you know what? It's just an organisation. In my experience, most people within an organization will either retire or die and they'll forget the argument will be forgotten and yeah. that's often you know i mean we can rail at the bbc or rail at the bfi or rail at they're just organizations with people flowing through them that, that don't even know you exist yeah. positively or negatively that's been my experience of life so far There's no point at railing at any organization and an organization cannot hate you or dislike you or because it's just pe made up of people who will eventually retire and die. So if you outlive them all, that no one will, that everyone, no one will be any the wiser. So go for it. But maybe a council culture is now playing into that oh, a bit yeah. more and it How makes people a lot culture? more paranoid. Makes you feel like your career well, is. is that, being I think I was cancelled. You know, you're working your way I was definitely cancelled before I even started. And... Yeah. That's fine. I can care less, though. 
because all the sales agents <laughs> hated me. And I remember doing a talk. I did this talk at Edinburgh Film Festival. Like, you know, the Edinburgh Film Festival, right? And um, at the interval, the person organising it grabbed me and went, you've got to stop. I went, stop what? You, what you're saying? You're basically saying all these sales agents are like crooks. I'm like, I'm just telling you, I'm just telling the story I've been always telling. And I don't care because most of those people do retire or they get fired or they just disappear. You know what I mean? It's like, they're just, it's just, it's, I know what you're saying about cancelling, but, but I think it can work in your favour in, 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 as well in the long run. That if you're, if you're, tr if you're truthful. Don't be a crook. And honest. <laughs> If you're truthful and honest, in the end, yeah, you can't be cancelled. And decent, and kind, and tolerant. Yeah. Surely most of the most. I mean, the, what I like about your films is those are those things that those um, those are the qualities that I get from you. But when surely I watch you can't films, be cancelled you know? if you were decent. Surely the only people getting cancelled are. Surely the only people getting cancelled are You'd the people that, that lied. Isn't that, isn't that why they get cancelled, celebrities? Because at some level they were liars? I think some people are misconstrued, maybe. Ah. Comedians get ah, in trouble, the political. They? You mean political you correctness like in the stand-up an organisation. Or... Like, like saying something that then might be taken out of context and suddenly you're accused of being racist or sexist. I get that. I see what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. There's Whereas a bigger comedy, conversation to be comedy is comedy, you know. Yeah. No, I agree. That's what I that agree. platform is for, isn't it? But... But, you know, Safe there are, I'm trying to think of the comedians that were cancelled for their, I don't think, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a cancel culture is an interesting subject. Dave Chappelle got in trouble, didn't it's he? It's really fascinating. Thankfully, mm. I, I don't live under that threat because no one knows who I am. And therefore, I'm free to go make my little films and, you know, my little, and then just, and then, that's fine. It's like I'm free of all that, that game, you know. Um, and that there's a certain freedom in in being independent like that. It's like the downside is no one's going to give you any money to make films. The upside is you're not answerable to anybody. Um, I feel like there's a pushback against it depends what it, it depends so what it, like, it depends what it depends what away anyway it depends what cancel how you define cancel culture it's like I think it's like like with James Corden for example and he's I mean the stories are so unpleasant right and then in the, the public perception of him is one I think it, there's a difference between people's public perception not marrying with how they really are. Weinstein and another, I mean, that was beyond cancel yeah. culture. That was just criminal. That was criminal. That was a me too. You know, or you look at some. Yeah. Or what about. Um, I wouldn't call that cancel face? culture. Uh, Ellen DeGener DeGeneres, Ellen, like, you know, being really mean to her staff, but then portraying kindness in the public sphere you know she's kind of been cancelled for that hasn't she for being yeah. being like be, be, be always deploy, deploying messages of positivity and kindness but being really cruel and mean to her staff i think cancel culture is more like you've worked your way you know for years decades for your career you know, and you say the wrong thing, wow. and all of a sudden, society has and the yet, power to just rip you down some, and take and it yet, away. And you're right, and yet some people and that's never get cancelled. You know, for all their horrific actions. How yeah. does that work? 
But the question I'd like to totally should answer, be. it's a really interesting discussion, this, and it's the subject of lots of films in the future, I reckon, is what is being cancelled? You know, when someone gets cancelled, what is it? What is it? What is it? You know, I'm trying to think of examples of people that were cancelled. Um, because I think it's I think it's happened for I don't think it's a recent. Your career thing. has gone. You're I think no it's longer been in the public eye. Since since media culture has been happening, since the fifties, where pop stars suddenly disappear, where TV presenters that fame there's that really famous seventies TV presenter yeah. has suddenly stopped getting work. There was there's there was there's so many people. There was like, I remember there was a sports pundit called Elton Wellsby. He was huge. Elton Wellsby. He was 80s, I think. And he was on every football show and then overnight disappeared for whatever reason. I don't know. I'm wondering whether it's always happened, always happening. Like you can go back to the old Hollywood stories where so many people's careers were just cut for a... a, a I think it's always happened. We well, just yeah, it sounds like it name. has been then, but now it's just you know, more. Certain actors' careers were mm. cut for for association with the Communist Party. They were cancelled. That's cancel culture, isn't it? The McCarthyism, yeah. all those trials, and the so if yeah. you were an American member of uh, an American actor or director or producer. Your career was cancelled as a result of being a mem you know, of being a member of a, of a of having a political affiliation that contradicted with the American dream, right? That's cancel culture in the fifties. It's always happened. We're just giving it a new spin. It's always happened. People mm. have dropped off the cliff edge all the time. You see it all the time, and you go right back to the twenties and thirties of Hollywood. You hear that you know, there are stories of actors that suddenly were had an indiscretion and then they were dropped by the studios and then they were destitute after that. It's a really interesting subject for a podcast. What is cancel culture? How long has it been going on for? Is it a recent phenomenon or are we just viewing it in a different way because of social media? Or is it more prevalent now? Well, I think or there's is more celebrities now. Easier to there get are more now. actors, more. I mean, I see people. I see people on Twitter with millions of followers. I never what, heard of easier. them. What's easier? And I, I say to my wife, "Who's that?" And she goes, "Oh, pardon." Well, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like but I've this, been living under like, a rock as well. Like, who is this person? It's social media. They're I just, so famous. I don't, Everyone I, knows who I they think are. There's right? just more of it. And we're exposed to more, our, our exposure to the world now is through yeah. the lens of social media is huge. But it's a really interesting, cancel culture is an interesting topic. You know, like I remember even like a Tory politician, I remember Cecil Parkinson as a kid, he was the chairman of the Conservative Party and he was made to resign because he had a, a child out of wedlock. And uh, he had a child with his mistress, I think. And it was a scandal on another level. And I remember it being front page news and he was effectively cancelled. Right. Today, that wouldn't make the newspapers. If, if... <laughs> you, you wouldn't, wouldn't be cancelled for that for these that. days. <laughs> the, the, the... But saying the wrong saying, thing in an oh God, interview so you might get cancelled for. Saying the wrong thing in an interview. Yeah, or a tweet. You could say like, the wrong I tweet, think, maybe. Or... I don't even think... Like, I saw someone, the footballer the other day, say the wrong, made the wrong tweet about the Queen's death. And he, there was a pylon, an absolute massive pylon. But I don't think he was cancelled. I just think he just got just a backlash and then it's forgotten i think i think people i think if i was an agent yeah. representing celebrities and famous people i'd just say don't worry it will blow over 
because it's tomorrow's it's like when they say tomorrow's fish and chip mm. paper, you know it's chip paper so just hang in it's how you play it we were just dis- we were discussing this weirdly with my family last night with gary neville who's who yeah. made a tutor said to me that part um, on um that quiz show yeah and we were playing like we pretend to be PR consultants. What line would you do? Because he's going out to Qatar to effectively commentate, and they were laying into him, saying, "Well, you're taking Qatari money." So we were playing like, "What would you do if you were his PR consultant? What line would you play?" And we were role playing that <laughs> with the family. My son wants to be a lawyer, you see. So we got into a disagreement. I was saying, "Well, he should have, you know, he should say I'm going to Qatar because I want to be at the, at the at the world's biggest sporting event for football. I don't want to miss it, and I'm going to give fifty percent of my salary away anyway, right?" And my son was arguing, "Well, you don't know. He might not be in a position to give fifty yeah. percent of his salary." I said, "Yeah, but the public perception is that he probably could, and that's the game I think you're constantly playing now in the public eye. It's like, what are you?" What are you doing to always make sure that you're yeah. being represented in the best way possible? It's a whole, there's a, probably a whole PR department now dealing with cancel, co- yeah. cancel, cancelling for various celebrities. Funny. Has that been helpful? Brilliant. Yes. So um damn absolutely not <laughs> um sh- <laughs> we'll discuss some edit um share your links for the wife and her house husband we know it's been released in march 2023 um so um, yeah What's the website? If you want to sign up, cinemaforapound.com, www.cinemaforapound.com. Sign up and I will legitimately spam you uh, nearer the time with an email pleading you to come to the cinema and to bring friends (laughs) all for a pound. So there you go. Brilliant. And you should visit Marx's uh, website for his blog posts as well, because I think they're great. They're really informative. Come to my Twitter. Come to Twitter, Marcus Marcu at Marcus Marcu, where where all the controversies and wisdom uh, and opinions are free flowing daily. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much appreciated. It's been fantastic. Congratulations. You're a brilliant podcast host. Brilliant. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You don't have to be drunk to dance. Daddy just put another pig in the bag. Ouch. Hey! Gotta love a downturn. You seem like such a lovely family. We hate doing this. Nigel. What is success? You've both come so far in this process. And it's to your credit. Can you sign the papers, please? You're the only man that I've ever loved. Matt, it is our letter. It's in our handwriting. So why are you getting so stressed about it? Do you remember it? No, I don't. I don't think that I actually appreciated for a minute what I had. 